Hello. I want to take just a minute and uh, visit with you uh, about a humanitarian crisis that is taking place right here in the heartland of America. Uh, but before I do that, I want to encourage you to take a minute and think about the most beautiful sound you've ever heard in your life. I can tell you that for me, I was a pretty crazy college kid. And so the one thing I wanted to do before I went to law school is I wanted to skydive. After all, I figured if I'm going to die, I might as well die before I spend three long years in a law school library, and I <laughs> certainly want to die before I have to take the bar exam. And so uh, fast forward to the day before I left Nebraska to go to law school at the University of Tulsa, and I decided to make the jump. I don't know how many of you have ever skydived before, but let me tell you, if you're looking to replicate uh, that experience without actually jumping out of an airplane, uh, get in your car tonight, roll the windows down, go 110 miles an hour, stick your head out the window. That's what skydiving is like. <laughs> so you may be wondering, well, how is this the most beautiful sound you've ever heard in your life? I could tell you. It's not necessarily plummeting to earth at 110 miles an hour, it's the second that you pull the ripcord. The second you pull that ripcord, there is absolute silence. It's literally nothing. You feel like it's nothing but you and God. And if you tandem jump, it's you, God, and another man that is <laughs> that's about as close to you as maybe you'll ever have another person. So, um, but that was for the first, at least the first 42 years of my life, uh, the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard in my life. Uh, and then fast forward uh, to February 23rd, 2012. And a little guy named Jacoby Ryan Meisch came into uh, to, uh, my life. Uh, and so for those of you who aren't parents yet and you want to replicate the experience, get into your car tonight, <laughs> go 110 miles an hour, <laughs> stick your head out the window, and, uh, and, and you can know what it's like to raise a child. You know? I had kind of a unique experience. Number one, I, I, I got into parenthood kind of late in the game. But also about six months after uh, my child was born, my mom had a, had a major catastrophic uh, stroke that, that left her paralyzed on the left side and, and with a, a serious case of dementia. I mention that just to say that ever since that time, I think kind of the convergence of having a child and having a mother struck by cancer or by, by, um, by a stroke uh, it made me so afraid that something bad was going to happen. And so almost every night from that day forward, for a long time, I would go into my son's room at night after he was asleep. And for parents, you know what this experience is like. You know that they're breathing, but you just want to be sure that they're breathing, right? So you tiptoe across uh, their room, and oftentimes you get down on a knee, and you're looking and you're looking. You don't want to turn on the light to wake him up, uh, but you just want to make sure that he's breathing. And so I would sit there and I would watch. And at the first sign of a breath, I would say, it's okay. But one night while I was leaning down, I couldn't help but think about an article that I had read uh, as a former liquor prosecutor and as a college professor now about an Indian reservation in Southwest South Dakota. It was called the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. For those of you who don't know, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation it is one of the largest Indian reservations in this country with over two million acres. And it's located in the southwest corner of South Dakota. Not only is Pine Ridge one of the largest reservations in the country, it's also one of the poorest reservations in the country. Over 50% of the people who live in Pine Ridge live at or below the poverty level. And it's estimated that over 50% of those who live in Pine Ridge are unemployed. It's, Pine Ridge is also interesting, at least to me, as a liquor prose, former liquor prosecutor, in that although the tribal government voted over 120 years ago that there would be no alcohol allowed on the reservation, over 60% of the men and women on the reservation suffer from alcoholism. So as I'm sitting on my knee that night, listening to my son breathe, I couldn't help but think of the other children uh, who were born in Pine Ridge, who would never have the same opportunities as my son has, because they were born into a family that suffered with addiction. You know, Pine Ridge is, uh, is a beautiful place, and they have really beautiful people. The culture is unbelievably rich. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that, in my mind, Pine Ridge is what happens when neither government 
nor corporations want to do the right thing. And so I want to take a few minutes and share with you what happens when you have a situation like that. Uh, Pine Ridge leads the country in a number of statistics, and I just want to share just a few. And one of the most, or one of the common and recurring themes you'll find is that almost invariably the impact of alcoholism on this high-risk population affects and impacts children. In Pine Ridge, for example, the infant mortality rate is 300% higher than the national average. In Pine Ridge, the teen suicide rate is 150% higher than the national average. In the last year alone, over 100 children between the ages of uh, 14 and 24 have attempted to take their life. And in the last year alone, 10 have been successful in doing so. Uh, not only is the infant mortality rate high, not only is teen suicide rate high, but one out of every four children is born with fetal alcohol syndrome. And for those of you who don't know what fetal alcohol syndrome is, it is caused uh, when a mother uh, consumes alcohol while she's pregnant. And all of us uh, tend to sweat out or have to sweat out the alcohol that we consume, but we can't sweat it all out at once. And so with fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol spe spectrum disorder, a fetus is actually swim literally swimming around in alcohol. Uh, during the gestation period. When a child is born with fetal alcohol syndrome, there is no cure. There really is no treatment for FAS. Uh, if you're born with fetal alcohol syndrome, you have it for the rest of your life. It is a neurological birth defects that will permanently scar you both physically and emotionally. And so that's the sort of image that hit home, hit home with me. And that's the image that inspired me to go up to Pine Ridge to do a film about four men in particular struggling with addiction. So you might be wondering, and on a reservation that size, where do all the people get all the beer if 60% of the men and women are suffering from alcoholism? Well, the answer is literally only two football fields away. As you can see from the slide, there's a small town just on the other side of the South Dakota border in the state of Nebraska. It's called White Clay, Nebraska. White Clay, Nebraska is a booming metropolis of 12 people. Those 12 people support four convenience stores. And those four convenience stores in a town of 12 people sell approximately 11,000 cans of beer every day. And for those of you who are like me, not that great at math, that's about four million cans of beer being sold in a town of 12 people with four convenience stores. So two years ago, I found someone who owned a camera and had a little bit of skill in, in shooting photography, and we went up to White Clay, and we found four men that were willing to tell their story about what it's like to suffer from addiction, what it's like to be born typically in a family of addiction, and what life is like uh, in White Clay, Nebraska. The men and women typically stand out on the street corner. This is a, a shot of White Clay, Nebraska, all one block of it. There's three convenience stores on one side, there's one convenience store on the other, and typically three or four dozen men and women, primarily men, on any given day of the week, any month of the year, will be standing outside soliciting money. It only takes $1.50 to get a 24-ounce can of malt liquor. That's 24 ounces of beer that contain roughly between 10 and 12% alcohol by volume. One of the men in the film actually tells the story about how he prostitutes himself for $5. And a lot of people who see my film, Sober Indian, Dangerous Indian, are taken aback, first of all, by the act of prostitution, and then they hear that it's $5, and they're like, that's unbelievable. But after you get to spend some time in white clay, you realize that it's really not that unbelievable, after all, if you have that addiction. After all, $5 will buy roughly four cans of malt liquor and every can is basically the equivalent of four cans, right, in one. So $5 will really get your fix between 16 and 20 cans of beer every day. There's a lot of responsibility to go around, and I'm not here today to tell you that one group is, is entirely responsible. But I do, now that I've presented you with the problem, I want to discuss and maybe explore some of the ways we can resolve this problem. First of all, the state of Nebraska. The state of Nebraska and the Nebraska Liquor Control Commission is empowered. In fact, it's not only authorized, but what the Nebraska citizens demand of it is that they enforce their liquor laws. Nebraska liquor law prohibits the Liquor Commission from issuing licenses in any town or village that lacks adequate law enforcement. 
And the fact of the matter is, is that White Clay is an unincorporated town. It lacks the basic infrastructure that one needs to sell alcohol. The nearest police station, the near, nearest uh, fire department, the nearest ambulance is over 20 miles away. So the first thing we can do, I believe, to address the issue of White Clay uh, is to actually enforce the liquor law and not issue licenses in unincorporated towns that lack adequate law enforcement. Another thing the state of Nebraska do, can do is to enforce its liquor laws that prohibit retailers from selling alcohol or selling beer to people who are over intoxicated. And just during a recent visit to uh, White Clay this summer, I can tell you that there are men that literally stumble into these stores every day. That shouldn't happen. Another uh, entity that's responsible is the tribal government itself. The tribal government has decided to be a dry reservation, but they uh, allocate very little, if any, money for treatment, recovery, and education. And that needs to change as well. One idea is to have the tribe actually legalize beer, sell it themselves, and earmark it earmark the revenues to go to treatment, recovery, and education, and that's certainly an idea. The third group that's responsible is Budweiser and the malt beverage industry. And the reason I pick out Budweiser is because Budweiser is the largest seller of beer in white clay. Over 70% of the beer that's sold in white clay is sold by Budweiser. We talk all the time about drinking responsibly. But at some point, I believe that we have to turn to Budweiser and say, we'll drink responsibly if you'll sell responsibly. As a former liquor regulator, I can tell you, whether it's Oklahoma City, where we have homeless men and women who drink alcohol and have addictions, or whether it's in White Clay, we always talk about it in terms of it being a homelessness problem, or in White Clay as an Indian problem. But very seldom, if ever, have I heard anyone ever stand up and say, maybe this is a capitalism problem or a corporation problem. And again, not to say that capitalism is bad or that, or that corporate corporations are bad, but at some point, corporations have to take responsibilities. Budweiser is exploiting the men and women of Pine Ridge by selling cheap malt liquor and white clay, and that needs to change. And finally, another responsible group is us, consumers. Whether you know it or not, you express an opinion every time you make a purchase. Social consumerism is more active and alive now than perhaps it's ever been in our country's history. Just ask SeaWorld. Just ask SeaWorld. After the uh, documentary Blackfish, uh, people stopped going to SeaWorld. They planned their vacations around SeaWorld. Musicians stopped performing at SeaWorld until SeaWorld made some very basic corporate changes to their business practices to ensure a more humane uh, treatment of, of uh, their killer whales. So it can happen. And you can be involved in that. So what can you do? First of all, you can write the President of the United States. Back in 1882, President Arthur created what was called the White Clay Extension, which prohibited whiskey peddlers from setting up uh, whiskey uh, stores and selling it to the uh, men and women of Pine Ridge. That executive order lasted for 22 years until it was repealed by Theodore Roosevelt. So if the President of the United States wanted to act, he could reinstitute by executive order the White Clay Extension. You could write a letter to the Nebraska legislature or to Governor Ricketts. But what I'm going to suggest today and what you could do tonight is urge Budweiser to support legislation to shut down beer sales in white clay. Urge them to get behind efforts to shut down white clay beer sales or simply choose another brewer. Simply choose another brewer. You know, we've shown this film throughout the United States from San Francisco to Chicago to New York all the way in Cape Town, South Africa. Students are always asking me, and people are always asking me, what can we do? And I always respond, what can't you do? What can't you do? We live in the freest country in this world. What can't you do? You can do so much. You know, about four years before I was even born, a man named Robert Kennedy flew all the way to Cape Town, South Africa, and he appeared in front of a group of white South Africans, urging them to make changes in their apartheid government. Robert Kennedy's speech resonates with me today, and I would suggest it may resonate to you, because he talked about the potential that people have uh, and what they can do to make a difference. Speaking to this group in, in Cape Town, South Africa, on the day of affirmation, he said, the answer to so many of our problems relies on youth. He said youth, not a time of life necessarily, but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of imagination, 
a predominance of courage over timidity and an appetite for adventure over the love of ease. I wanna encourage you to get involved in whatever it is. Take that empathy that you have toward your fellow man and turn it into action. Give that empathy legs and go out there and help us make a difference. Thank you.